the most up-to-date information and to learn about our COVID safety guidelines. I hope you enjoyed, uh, you'll enjoy tonight's pre-pub trivia and music by local Portland artist, Stephanie Schneiderman. We hope to have her in a Kindle concert in 2021. Putting on a live show takes a lot of work and we have an amazing partner that makes this happen. A big thanks and shout out to Celestream for providing the live stream services for tonight's Science Pub. We really, really appreciate their support. Since we're all here to learn about the dynamic geology of the Oregon coast, you might also be interested in knowing that beginning on March 11th, Oregonians will be able to receive earthquake early warning on their mobile phones. ShakeAlert detects an earthquake that has just begun and creates an alert that can be sent to mobile devices. These alerts can reach some users 10 seconds or tens of seconds before the actual shaking does, giving them time to prepare. So if Oregon gets a significant earthquake after March 11th, you could potentially get an alert via wireless emergency alert, which is similar to an Amber Alert. These same alerts can be delivered by the app Quick Alert USA, which you can download in your app store and through a built-in function of the Android operating system on newer Android phones. The important thing to remember, which I'm sure Dr. Burns will reiterate, is that if you get an alert or feel shaking, drop, cover, and hold on. Join us for our seventh virtual OMSI After Dark a West Coast Cider Fest. We currently have curated a box of 10 ciders with four from Oregon, four from Washington, and two from California. Enjoy science demos, interviews with the cideries, entertainment, music, and more at the virtual event on Friday, March 26th. Early bird discount tickets are available for $49 until March 14th. OMSI remember, members receive 15% off. Visit omzi.edu after dark for more information. All right, and of course, we always encourage you to put the pub back in the science pub experience by, exp uh, by ordering some delicious food and tasty beverages from one of our partners around the state, which we have here on the screen for you. But Tonight's event will look very similar to our regular Science Pub program. For those of you who don't know what a regular Science Pub looks like, we are going to begin with an Oregon Coast themed trivia game that is a warm up for tonight's talk. So grab a uh, paper and a pen so that you can participate. After that, we'll have a lecture by Dr. Scott Burns. For the Q&A after the lecture, you can submit your questions at uh, at any point in the comment in our live feed. We will collect them, and after the lecture, I will be asking your questions to the speaker. If you enjoyed tonight's lecture, please consider making a donation or purchasing a Science Pub pint glass. Don't worry, there's no pressure to donate. Our mission at OMSI is to inspire curiosity by creating engaging science learning experiences for people of all ages and backgrounds. So sit back, relax, and get ready for a great lecture. All right, so this week we have Jenny Crane, program developer at OMSI, joining us to play along live with you at home. Please give her a warm round of applause. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's good to see you, Jenny. I think I know the answer to this, and maybe we've already talked about it, but what are you most excited to learn about during tonight's show? Well, geology, obviously. Um, I'm kind of a geology nerd, into earthquakes, do a lot of earthquake education with OMSI. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have said that because then maybe I've raised expectations for, you know, my ability to actually answer these questions correctly, but I'm going to do my best. <laughs> it's always nice to know we have a ringer in the room. No, oh, I don't know. All right, well, let's get started with our trivia game. Everyone grab a pen or a, pa uh, or a pencil and paper so you can play against your family. I suggest you make it a little interesting. You can play for bragging rights or who can do the next dishes, uh, who has to bake cookies, whatever. Take, uh, take out the trash, just make it fun. There are 10 multiple choice questions. I'll read out a question, give you time to guess, and then reveal the answer before moving on to the next one. Well, I can't know, I don't know if they're ready, but Ginny, are you ready? I'm ready. All right, question number one. Along the Oregon coast in the estuaries are a lot of dead trees we call ghosts Ghost forests, what do we think killed them? Landslides, 
too many beavers in the estuaries, too many floods on the river, or the last subduction earthquake? I know this one. Um, this one is D, the earthquake, which uh, caused them all to flood. Are you sure? I mean, they're ghosts. I mean, it could have been beavers. I mean, beavers could have very well have had something to do with it, but I, but I think it's D. D, okay. The last subduction earthquake. All right, here's the answer. Yes, you are correct. It is the last subduction earthquake. Do you remember? Do you know when it was, Denny? Uh, 1700. Excellent. Just checking. <laughs> I, don't, I used to know the date, but I, I was going to pull the date, but I don't remember at the moment. It's January something. Yeah, January something, yeah. Yeah. All right. What is the farthest west point and the lower 48 states on the Pacific Ocean? Is it A, mm. Cascade Head, B, Yaquina Head, C, Cape Blanco, or D, Cape Lookout? Hmm. Don't know. I'm like trying to like zoom in on that map. It doesn't say. Yeah, you know, it's, um, darn it. It's, there's a little um, I'm, there. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take a wild guess here because I don't actually know. Um, Yaquina Head. Yaquina Head here in Newport? Sure. Okay. All right. Let's see. And the answer is Cape um, Blanco, which is a little bit south of here. Um, okay. I'm, Obviously, a little bit more west. And I don't know how far. I wonder how far that that actually is. I don't know the distance, but it's a little bit south of here. All right. Are you keeping score for yourself, Jenny? Oh yeah, I'm one one and one. Yeah, I don't know who you're playing with, but it's very important that you know you keep track of that. Number three, the main rock of the northern headlands out in the Pacific Ocean on the Oregon coast are made of a basalt from volcanic vents in northeast Oregon. B, granite, C, sedimentary rocks like shales and sandstones from uplift of the coastal range, or D, basalt from the volcanic vents in the coast range. Trying to remember back from the geology regional field trip I took in college. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's basalt. And if it's in the northern part, I'm going to go it's from the vents, like came all the way down to Columbia. I'm I'm hoping that's right. I could be wrong. Okay, so your answer is A, A, A yeah. basalt from volcanic vents in Northeast Oregon. <clears throat> All right, here we go. The answer is correct. Woo! Basalts from the volcanic vents in Oregon. And, um, you know, if you ever get to Yaquina Head, they have cobble beach and you can see that some of those basalts have like broken off and they make these cobbles and they kind of roll around. And Oh, cool. I love standing there because it sounds like the, the waves make this like a uh, marble sound as, as this rocks rolling against each other of all that basalt. It's very That's cool. Awesome. All right. The biggest landslide on the Oregon coast is where? A, Ecola State Park. B, Silver Point Landslide in Cannon Beach. C, Beverly Beach, which is north of Newport. Or D, the Hukunandan Landslide. Uh... I do not know, but I like the sound of Huskanaden. That sounds <laughs> I I got that say, right. <laughs> so I'm going to go with that one. Huskanaden. Mm -hmm. All right. And the answer is the hey, Huskanaden landslide. You're going to say that doubt. a couple more times. When in doubt, choose Huskanaden. <laughs> I will take that into my next meeting. All right. Number five. Here we go. What is the origin of most sand of the sand on the Oregon beaches? Is it A, erosion of sand from the headlands next to the beaches? B, erosion of sand from offshore reefs? C, erosion of sand from inland rocks transported to the beaches by rivers? Or D, erosion of sand from shale bedrock outcrops along the coast? Well, I, I'm not familiar with any offshore reefs on the Oregon coast, well, at least maybe not coral reefs, but um, I guess to me, sand from inland rocks transported to the beaches by rivers seems like a plausible answer to me. Okay. I'm going to go see. Have you ever like stared at the sand of the beach? Have you ever like looked at it and seen all the different colors? Yeah, totally. That's kind of why I'm thinking like, you know, transported down like miniature version of river rocks. Okay, yeah. All right, here we go. The answer is C. All right. Erosion of sand from inland rocks transported to the beaches by the rivers. 
I live next to South Beach State Park and I can tell you there's like little black bits and little um, rusty orange bits and little clear bits and little white bits. It's actually pretty colorful sand when you look at it. So you gotta think about all that erosion is pretty fascinating where that all came from. All right, halfway there. What's your score, Jenny? I don't know, I'm not keeping track. Uh, I think, I know I got at least one wrong. Did I get one or two wrong? Okay, so, you know, in case people from home want to compete I'm either, against you. I'm either four and one or three and two. Can't remember. All right. Number six, the town of Manzanita is built mostly on what? A, sand dunes. B, basalt from volcanic vents. C, an old landslide from Nekahani Mountain. Or D, river deposits from the Nehalem River. I have no idea, but you know, the choose the most exciting sounding word strategy worked for me last time. Okay. So I'm going to use it again and go for Nekahani Mountain. Sand Dunes doesn't, doesn't do that for you? Is that as exciting? Yeah. Okay. Nekahani Mountain. All right, here we go. Answer is A. Oh. <laughs> of course, it won't be the boring one. Come on. Why would you throw in a, a red herring like Nekahani Mountain? That's just cruel. <laughs> You know, actually, I didn't know the answer, but I'm really amused that I kind of prompted you in the answer and you still didn't take my advice. <laughs> all right. And number seven, why have all of the four dunes, which is the dune closest to the ocean in the front of the beach, along the Oregon coast grown and the Washington coast? Let me read that again. Why have all the four dunes, the, the dune next to the beach, along the coast grown so much in the last 70 years? Said A, lots of driftwood logs on the beaches have trapped the sand. B, planting of European beach grass has trapped blowing sand from the beaches. C, increased tsunami activity along the coast has deposited sand. Or D, longshore drift of beach sand has brought sand to the dunes. You know, we do this uh, science communication fellowship program at OMSI where like scientists come and um, tell us about the research and learn how to talk to the public about it. And we had one science fellow who studied beach grass on the dunes. And I sort of recall that a component of her research had to do with dune building because of mm -hmm. European beach grass. So I'm going to go with that. Yeah, actually, I know who you're talking about. I've talked to her as well. I've seen, I've seen her work. Um, and so planting of Woo beach grass has trapped blowing sand from the beaches. I, I will add in the extra fact that um, covering that beach grass actually with sand stimulates growth. It is a way that yeah, it's like a mm -hmm. whack a mole situation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It um, it wants to be covered and it will grow taller. So that's why we have giant four dunes. All right, number eight. What type of rock is haystack rock at Cannon Beach? Is it A. Granite. B. Sandstone. C. Shale. Or D. Basalt. I don't know. Uh, I'm just going to go with basalt because when in the Pacific Northwest, when in doubt, choose basalt. You're it's true. More Those Columbia not, River right. basalts have, sure. have done a lot for yeah. Oregon. <laughs> and for you. Also, <laughs> Yay. Good job. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of our um, Highway 101 was built with basalt as well. My, um, quarry, quarried basalt. All right. Number nine. Why did the city of Bay Ocean on the coast fall into the ocean, disappear? So A, a tsunami wiped it out. B, building of a jetty changed longshore current, sand currents leading to erosion. C, a large landslide slid down the slopes and removed the town. Or D, a series of six major floods wiped it out. Hmm. I do not know anything about the history of Bay Ocean, but... I mean, B, that kind of sounds like the thing, like the kind of thing that might happen. So I'm going to go with of, B, the jetty. And yeah. Do you have any idea of where Bay Ocean was? No. <laughs> okay. So you just hope Hopefully that the jetty. Bay and the ocean. Was there a bay and an ocean? <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. It, um, I, I will give you the hint that it was by Tillamook Bay. Oh. All right. Let's see. Yes, you are correct. Building of a jetty changed longshore sand currents leading to erosion. We also Lesson learned. See, yeah. You know, and here in Newport, we have a jetty as well. We definitely have seen, you know, different changes of, of um, longshore currents as well. Uh, haven't eroded a town, but, you know, it has still changed things. 
All right. This is the last question, Jenny. Where are you, where's your score at? Uh, I've lost track. I, th- I know I've missed at least two, maybe three. All right. Averages. Okay. Yeah. So you, Getting at least a B or C average here. <laughs> last question. During El Nino years, what happens along the Oregon coast? A, major erosion of the beach sand at the southern ends of beaches. B, many rivers deposit abundant sand in the upper drainages. C, major erosion of the beach sand at the northern end of beaches. Or D, major growth of sand dunes along the coast. I think that's meant to be the coast. Yeah. Um, I have no idea. Um, I know that El Nino is usually like warmer and wetter, right? I think. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm not sure how that would translate to erosion. Uh, I mean, I could see maybe a warmer and wetter precipitation year could perhaps lead to more river deposits. Like, uh, so um, based on the very limited information and knowledge on this topic, I'm going to go with B. B, the many rivers deposit abundant sand in their upper drainages. Oh, their upper drainages. Oh, that wouldn't make sense. It would have to be lower. I'm changing my answer. Okay. I might regret it. Uh, Let's go with C, major erosion. Of the, just to confirm, major erosion of the northern end of the beach or the southern end of the beach? Oh, gosh. And northern? That's, yeah, that's the difference between A and C here. Yeah, we'll, go with, we'll just go with C. C. I truly have no idea. All right. Ah, okay. Major erosion of the beach sand at the southern ends of the beaches. I, well, I look forward to maybe finding out why that is. because Yeah, I'm pretty curious about that. Fill in that gap in my knowledge. All right. Well, Jenny, thanks for joining us tonight, and I hope all of you at at, at phone. I'm sorry, and I hope all of you at home had fun learning something new. <laughs> thanks so much. Take care, Jenny. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Scott Burns. Dr. Scott Burns is professor emeritus of geology and the past chair of the Department of Geology at Portland State University, where he has taught for over 20 years. He has a BS degree in chemistry and an MS degree in physical science from Stanford University and a PhD in geology from the University of Colorado Boulder. Dr. Burns specializes in environmental and engineering ecolo- geology, geomorphology, soils, and quaternary geology. In Oregon, his projects involve landslides and land use, environmental cleanup of service stations, slope stability, earthquake hazard mapping, the Missoula floods, Paleo souls, oh, oh. lowest souls, stratigraphy. You're gonna help have to help me with some of these radon generation from soils, and the distribution of heavy metals and trace elements in Oregon soils and alpine soil development. He has won many awards for outstanding teaching and his work in geology, including the Distinguished Faculty Award from the Portland State Alumni Association in 2001 the Richard Yon's Award for Geology, for Engineering Geology from GSA and the AEG in 2001, the Outstanding Scientist for Oregon in 2014 from the Oregon Academy of Sciences. He has authored more than 100 publications and received more than 25 research grants. Dr. Burns is actively helping local TV and radio stations and newspapers bring important geological news to the public and for the past 51 years has been studying wine and terrier the relationship between wine, soils, geology, and climate. It's definitely enough talking for me. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Scott Burns. Take it away, Scott. And thank you very much for the, uh, for the introduction. Uh, thanks for the uh, uh, quiz too. And uh, congratulations uh, to Jenny for doing so well. Uh, the names of those mountains are Neakani Mountain and the biggest landslide on the Oregon coast. Who's Canadian? I threw you when I wrote those questions, I threw in a couple of very difficult uh, names to talk about. So uh, welcome to everybody who was here tonight. And uh, we're just going to have fun. I love uh, doing science pubs with OMSI. I've been doing it for, well, ever since they started. And uh, um, one year ago, we, we went virtual. And I still remember that night when we talked about the geology of the uh, Columbia Gorge. Tonight, what we're going to do is shift to the Oregon coast. And everybody loves going to the coast. 
But wherever you go on the coast, and it's different as you go from the northern end all the way to the southern end, there's a story. Locally, every place, Mother Nature is shouting out to you. And there are some real mysteries that are down there. And so what I wanted to do was pass along some of those to you tonight uh, as we go through. So that that is the aim and the objective. And then at the end, if you have any questions, uh, we'll get a chance to um, do that. Let's see if I can get to the next one. Okay, hold on. There we go. Okay. So uh, what am I going to talk? I'm going to start talking a little bit of background of the geology of Oregon, uh, focus in on the coast. Tectonics, the Juan de Fuca plate that is off of the coast uh, and subducting down underneath us. What does it do to the coast and to Oregon? And the bedrock geology of all those headlands and the areas in between the headlands along the coast. Landslides are a big deal on the coast. I'll mention a few of those. Another thing is when you go uh, down to the coast and you look at the the sand on the beach, you come back two weeks later, the sand that is there has moved on and it moves back and forth and back and forth and uh, in and out all of the time. We're going to talk about that sediment transport on the beaches. And then, uh, as you saw in the questions, Bay Ocean, the city that fell into the ocean on the Tillamook Spit. Why? And it, it's all an understanding of this movement of the sediment up and down the coast. Uh, world famous, by the way. And then we'll talk about sea cliffs and we'll talk about sea stacks and the most famous sea stack in Oregon, uh, Haystack Rock. But did you know that there are two Haystack Rocks in Oregon? And then we also have lots of sand dunes up and down the coast. Why? And I'm going to en end up talking about earthquakes and tsunamis, something that we need to know about. Uh, uh, very, very important. I forgot to put the slide in about radon, so I'll tell it to you right now. I've been working uh, um, with the people who live in Oceanside, which is down near Tillamook. And another one of the areas of study that I do is uh, radon. And in fact, at a, a science club uh, at Kennedy School last year, we talked about it. And radon is a natural gas that comes out of the ground. Uh, and Portland has a big, big problem. The good news is it's cheap to test and it's cheap to mitigate if you've got a problem. It causes, it's the number two cause of ca lung cancer in the United States behind uh, smoking. And so we want everybody to check their house to make sure it's less than four picocuries per liter. And if it's high, get something done. Well, one of the ladies who was at the science pub at the Kennedy School had a house down also at Oceanside. So she checked her house and it was really high, 30 picocuries per liter, really, really high. And so she has mitigated her house. She's had the, a lot of her friends along the coast to do that in that area. And they're all checking their houses. We encourage you to go down to your local hardware store, buy a testing kit, short-term, long-term ones, send it in, get the number back, and the, very important for you to learn about. We want to save lives. We didn't think the Oregon coast had a problem. All right, so here is a shaded relief map of the state of Oregon with major areas, the Blue Mountains in the east, the Coast Range here, Klamath Mountains down here, Coast Range you have there, Willamette Valley. And last time I did it at Science Pub, I talked to Clump about the Columbia Gorge. And so those are the different uh, areas, ecological uh, areas of the state. I'm going to be focusing in on the coast range and specifically the Oregon coast and also the Klamath Mountains on the coast down there today. Let's go back in time. 200 million years ago when all of the continents were stuck together. Uh, and that was in a gigantic uh, continent called Pangaea. And then magma coming out of the ground, uh, as you can see the darker areas that you got there, started moving those plates to the side and they're continuing to move away from one another. Uh, and breaking up. Uh, and that is what we call plate tectonics. Uh, and that kind of unifies all of geology today. Why is it happening? Because there are weaknesses in the uh, uh, crust and magma comes up from down in the mantle and then solidifies. Then more magma comes up, pushes the plates to the side and then solidifies. More comes up. And so the rate of magma coming up causes the rate of, of moving from one side to the other. In North America, we are moving um, at a rate of uh, two centimeters a year in a westerly direction. So here we are in North America and in Oregon. We're moving uh, because there is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge that creates uh, magma coming up and we're moving away from it. 
There used to be a huge plate off of the west coast of North America that was being subducted underneath North America called the Farallon Plate. Today, they're just three little wimpy plates. You can see those little red ones up there. Uh, the Explorer Plate, the uh, Juan de Fuca Plate, and the Gorda Plate. And they are going under Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia. And then we'll talk about that in a second. So they are a remnant of that. Uh, also, if we go back in time, 150 million years ago, there wasn't any Oregon. Uh, the, the west coast of North America was over in Idaho and up, 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 up in Montana, and most of Alaska was missing. And what happened was, um, as plates would be subducting, as you can see here, descending ocean slab, uh, if, if there was an island or even some old ocean bottom, it would get stuck onto North America called accretion. And all of Oregon is accreted terrain that has been stuck on. And then we have a whole bunch of volcanic deposits on top of it. Uh, and so here is a map of all the accreted terrain in North America and Kamchatka and then Southeast Asia stuck on by plate tectonics in the past. So today we have a plate off of the coast, and I'll show you a better one in a second, that is running into North America. It's oceanic plate, uh, the Juan de Fuca plate. And anytime you hit a, uh, a plate that has continental rocks on it, it, the oceanic plate will be subducted down underneath the other, and then eventually it will melt, come back to the surface as a chain of volcanoes. And that's what's occurring along our uh, coast. And the, where it's going in is a trench off of the coast called Cascadia. 200 miles off of the coast, you have a chain of volcanoes uh, that is creating a plate that is moving four centimeters a year, about as fast as your fingernail grows, uh, to in an easterly direction. And then the Gorda Plate, the southern part down here, is a little bit slower down there, uh, and it too is being subducted down underneath North America, melting, coming back to the surface, chain of volcanoes from Mount Lassen down in California all the way up to Mount Garibaldi up in uh, British Columbia. Sometimes it sticks as it, as it goes down, and then it, then it breaks all the way from all the way in Northern California up into British Columbia. It creates a huge, what we call, subduction zone earthquake. Sometimes it breaks even more readily down on the Gorda Plate, twice as fast as the whole one. We'll talk about that at the end. And so here we have oceanic crust going down, North America going in a westerly direction, and then as the plate goes down, it uplifts all of the sediments along the coast. And all of those sediments and ocean bottom were underneath the ocean, and now they've been uplifted into our coast range. And then the Cascades, those are the chain of volcanoes uh, from the subduction and the melting of the, the uh, uh, crust uh, as it goes down underneath. And then you have the Willamette Valley, as you can see, in between the two of them. So to begin with, how about the rocks that we find along the coast? Uh, and uh, along the Oregon, uh, northern Oregon coast, up in this region, and then southern Washington, you have a lot of headlands that stick out into the ocean, and then more indentations, bay areas in between. All of those uh, uh, headlands are uh, made out of a rock called basalt, and it is, it's slower erosion than the area in between. And originally we thought they came out of volcanic vents that were in the coast range, but there are no volcanic vents in the coast range. Mar Beeson in our department started doing the geochemistry on it. And he said, oh my God, the, 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 uh, they are uh, the Columbia River basalts. And they came out of the ground where Oregon, Washington, and Idaho come together over here. Uh, and that is a hot spot. That hot spot is kind of an arm off of the main hot spot, which uh, was at the same time uh, down in Northern Cal uh, where, where Oregon, Idaho, and Nevada come together. Uh, and, and, and then, so what happened is the majority of the, the rock that came out of the ground, it oozed out, and I'll show you that in a second. Uh, it formed uh, all of the layers of basalt in east, southeastern uh, Washington. And then a lot of it got into the ancestral Columbia River and flowed all the way out into the ocean, emptied into the ocean from Newport all the way up to Willapa Bay. One flow after another after another. It came, it, it, that magma comes all the way from the mantle, very, very hot, and it can flow for a long distance before solidifying. Uh, and then that whole area was uplifted and all of those uh, de deposited rocks that you have down there uh, form the headlands that we have today. It's interesting that hot spot eventually 
slowed down here, it shut down, but it's still continued in Southeast Oregon. And then it, then North America continued to pass across there. And that hot spot moved all the way up through Idaho. And it's what we call the Snake River floodplain. And, and it continuously had more and more basalt coming out. Today, it is located underneath Yellowstone National Park. Uh, and every 600,000 years, there's a major volcanic eruption, a super volcano that comes out and it blows up. And so uh, Yellowstone National Park is a result of the, uh, the last super volcano or last three ones. And that's the same hot spot that formed the Columbia River basalts. And uh, it used to be off of the coast. The Pacific Northwest is rotated in a, uh, in a uh, clockwise manner. And it used to be off of the coast, and now it's underneath the coast range. It is the basalt that is underneath it. We call Celestia, and it's an accreted terrain, one of the last ones that is there. And so this is what northeastern Oregon looked like. Just big cracks in the ground, just like in Hawaii, magma coming up to the surface, just oozing out, oozing out. Nothing like a Mount St. Helens that you have got. And you can see this map put together by Marv Beeson, another guy in our department, of all of the different types of basalt um, that you have got and, and then flowing down to the, the coast. And when you see it out in, uh, um, in, in the environment in the Pacific Northwest, it's just layer upon layer upon layer of black rock. Go to Multnomah Falls, our number two tourist attraction in the state of Oregon, and you can see number, you can have five different layers, one on top of another of uh, Columbia River basalt. Here is your Quinta Head along the, the coast, very close to where Anne lives. Uh, and that is the salt flow that flowed all the way across the state of Oregon and out into the ocean where it solidified. Uh, here's Hesita Head, another one of these basalt flows that flowed all the way uh, across the state of Oregon. And then you have Tillamook Head Lighthouse, um, uh, which is just next to Cannon Beach. And it is part of one of these flows that came uh, from eastern uh, Oregon and then solidified and then uh, the rock around it has eroded away. I love this one. This is Cape Fowlweather. There's the visit. There's a little uh, gift shop that is up there, and they go in. And they say, "Oh, we are built on an old volcano. It sure looks like a volcano, doesn't it? It's all Columbia River basalt. It's all basalt that came from eastern Oregon. But this is a landslide that caused this to come down, and it's not the crater of a volcano that you see right there." So when you fly over the coast range, kind of boring because there are a lot of trees that are there, but you have got all uplifted sedimentary rocks, mostly shales and sandstones, that were off of the coast of Oregon before, and then that's all been uplifted because the Juan de Fuca plate is being subducted down underneath North America. And at the heart, you've got Celestia, the Sletz Volcanics, for instance, uh, at the, the, the heart of that. Uh, and then, uh, then you have rivers that go through the coast range and out into the uh, ocean. Uh, you have the Rogue River um, uh, uh, the, down south, for instance, one of those. All of those rivers are bringing sand from the weathering of the rocks that are found either in the Klamath, like the Rogue River, uh, or in the coast range. And, and that is where the origin of all the sand along the Oregon coast has come from. It's come out of the rivers and then uh, it, it gets into what we call the longshore drift, moves up and down the coast within the cells. There are 30 cells up and down the coast. I'll talk about those coming in a second. So where does the sand come from? It comes from the weathering uh, of the rocks in the coast range. And then you have sedimentary types of rocks to go with the uh, basalt, especially as you go further down south. And I threw a question in there about Cape Blanco. Uh, it's all sedimentary rocks, as you can see down here. But it is the furthest west point in the lower 48 states. Uh, and it's on a terrace. It's on the Whiskey Run Terrace, which is about a 70,000-year-old uplifted seafloor that has brought that sedimentary rock up to the surface. And you can see that Whiskey Run Terrace on the left-hand side down here uh, going up and down the, the coast that, that is there. Uh, closer to where Anne lives, uh, you have um, just north of uh, Newport, you've got Devil's Punch Bowl, all sedimentary rock, shales and sandstones that are there. Great place to visit in the wintertime when you have big uh, high tides and big waves coming in. Uh, and then going back down south, uh, down uh, near Coos Bay, you've got Cape, uh, sorry, Cape Cone is a Pacific City. You've got other sedimentary rocks that you've got there. And then down south, you have Coos Bay, you have um, uh, incredible sedimentary rocks that are uplifted in an anticline along, along the coast down there. So the coast is primarily sedimentary rocks and then the basalt that you've got. 
How, so landslides are a major thing up and down the coast. Uh, and it's the nightmare for all of the engineering geologists and geotechnical engineers with the uh, Oregon Highway Department, ODOT. Uh, and this is my favorite landslide in the state of Oregon. This is the Huskanaden. This is down south. Uh, it's over 100 square miles. Uh, and it is all, everything you see in this picture is moving down into the ocean. And, uh, and Melanie, in the questions that she put, showed you before, she had a picture of last year, there was a major landslide on Highway 101 in the Huskanaden that you've got there. When I took this picture here, I was on a road. They don't pave it because they just have to, uh, just bring the road grader in once or twice a year because it's always continuously moving. Um, and then if any of you go to Cannon Beach, at the northern end of Cannon Beach is Ecola State Park. Uh, that is an old landslide. As a kid growing up in Oregon, I still remember when this whole thing slid down into the ocean. And then if you go to the far end, of of Cannon Beach, way down over here, you have the Silver Point landslide. Three houses in the 1980s slid down into the ocean as they're undercut down there. So landslides are everywhere up and down the coast. Here's a, a very famous one in Southern Oregon, Arizona in landslide. You can see where the scarp of that landslide came down, closed Highway 101 for about a year. And people had to go five or six hours out of their way to get around from one end uh, to the other end. Uh, and then a uh, news item I wanted to throw in, uh, and then landslides are always happening, but one of the most famous landslides along the coast occurred in Newport, where Ann lived. Uh, and that is the Jump Off Joe Landslide. Uh, and uh, it's found uh, in the cliffs that are there. And, it, and it's had a couple episodes of reactivating and reactivate. Well, it just reactivated a couple weeks ago because of so much rainfall that we have had this winter time. It, in the 1980s, it destroyed a condo. And now, because of all the king tides and the rainfalls, it is uh, slightly creeping again. So now let's focus on the beaches and the sand. And so in this diagram that we've got here, here is the ocean, here is the sand that you can see here. And in the wintertime, the dominant direction of the winds coming are coming from the northwest. And so you can see the, if the north is to the left-hand side. The waves will come in and it'll push the sand up onto the beach like this, but gravity will pull that sand grain back down. And then the next wave comes in and it'll push it up at an angle and then back down by gravity. Whoops, let's go back. Uh, and, and so all those particle sands are slowly moving down the beach uh, in the dominant wind direction. In years when we have El Nino, where the dominant uh, rate, uh, winds and everything are coming from the Central Pacific, the winds are from the south. And so they move the sand in a northerly direction. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a, in a second. And what it does is it, it causes incredible erosion at the southern end of the cells, these 30 cells that we find up and down the coast. And so the sand is always moving. There's also another movement, and that is on and off the, the, the shore. And in the wintertime, when you have lots and lots of waves, uh, the waves erode away a lot of that sand and move it off into offshore bars. Um, and then in the summertime with uh, milder waves, all that sand will eventually move back in. And the, uh, the, the beaches in the summertime are very, very wide. Wintertime, very, very narrow beaches. So you have on and offshore and then up and down the coast. And so the sand that is moving down, if you have a bay like this, the sand will move from the beach on the left-hand side and it will form a spit here. And eventually that spit will grow all the way across, across and that's what we call a bay mouth bar. And then here's another spit growing into another bay down here. Uh, and in Oregon, we have got six major spits that face in the northerly direction. And they tell us that the local longshore drift in that area is moving in a northerly direction. This is like a slit uh, spit. And then we have other six other ones that are south facing uh, spits. And so this, these are all formed by sand go coming out into the bay as you go up and down. So here is the Salishan spit that I was just showing you, Salette's Bay in, in the background that you see down here. Another one is just north of there, Cascade Head. This is the Sandy or Salmon River one in a northerly direction, as you can see. Here is the Manzanita, uh, or the Nehalem spit. The Nehalem River is in the background here. It is in a, facing in a southerly direction. And then here is Manzanita, one of our questions earlier. And it's all built on sand dunes. And it, during those years when we have a lot of, 
uh, El Nino. You'll have most of the winds coming from the southwest and driving the sand and eroding the sand at the southern end and moving it to the north end. And so you get huge amounts of sand here. And then in the summertime, all the winds blow that sand in land and you have just a huge complex of sand dunes that you have got there. Uh, and, uh, and then here is a Bay Wealth Barrier. This is the Rockaway. Uh, one and it's that sand spit just completely grew right across this old uh, bay that you see right there uh, and then here's Neetart's uh, spit uh, this is one of the northern facing ones uh, this is down south uh, and, and near Cape Lookout so those are uh, different uh, deposits that you have got here is also the Sletz Bay, Salishan Spit that you see here. And in the background, there are going to be some of these ghost forests, dead trees that I'm going to talk about coming up in just a few moments. And these estuaries. Now, uh, what along the coast, sometimes humans will put uh, obstacles out into the ocean. And it, because remember, the sand is moving in one direction or an another. And they, we can tell what the dominant direction is at that particular place. So we have jetties and we build jetties so you will, it'll be easier for boats to go in and out of the harbors that we have next to them. And then some other places we will put groins in. Um, and we don't have too many of these on the Oregon coast, but on the East coast, they put them because there isn't a lot of sand. And what it does is stops the sand and your beach will grow. And so here is, for instance, in New Jersey. Groins. Here's a groin, there's a groin, there's a groin. And you can notice on the on this side, uh, you have got huge amounts of sand, and on the other side, not very much. So you have deposition or aggradation and degradation on the this, uh, other side. So it's telling us the dominant longshore drift is moving from the, the bottom of the screen up to the top. So when you go to the beach, always look at those. What direction is the dominant uh, movement of the sand? Here's this one you can't miss. This is Ocean City, Maryland. You can see a jetty here. There's one jetty and another one. And you've got a big building out of a beach up here. And then on the other side, look at the erosion over here. So it's telling us that the uh, longshore drift is going from south to north. And they put little tiny little uh, groins uh, down here. So let's come back to where Ann lives down in Newport. And she was talking about the jetty that you've got down there. And so look at on the south side, look at how much sand on the beach here, how much sand on the north side, not very much. What does that tell you? Mother Nature is shouting out. The dominant uh, lo longshore drift in this locality is from the south to the north uh, that you've got. Or we go to the Nahalem one, and they, both sides are exactly the same. He said, oh, yeah, it's tough to tell. Well, uh, the Nahalem uh, spit is going in this direction from left to right. But the problem is the Nahalem River delivers so much sand into the ocean that this cell has got so much sand that it degrades on both sides. And both of the, uh, both of the beaches have grown since they built the jetties in that particular area. Now I take you down to the exciting uh, spit that we have got here, and that is the Tillamook spit. And <coughs> you'll notice there are two jetties there. The North Jetty that it was here, built between 1914 and 1917, and then the South Jetty, which was built many, many years later. And back in 1906, the, the spit that was here was huge, went all the way up to this area here. And a man named Thomas Potter came in and bought 600 uh, acres on this, and he built a city. Uh, so here is a picture, the Landsat picture, of the Tillamook Spit, the Tillamook Bay, all the five rivers bringing the sand into the river, filling it up, uh, and then the two jetties that you see out here. So the city of Bay Ocean was built out here on that spit. And back in the Oregonian newspaper, back in 1907, 1908, 1909, etc., there were signs for Bay Ocean. Uh, uh, buy a, a, a piece of plot uh, to build a house on the Oregon coast, sold to you by the Potter Chapin Realty. And, 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 and what happened was a guy named Potter bought the land and he partitioned off 4,000 lots. In the end, he sold 1,600 of them. He built the first Olympic-sized natatorium in Oregon on the beach there. Uh, and uh, incredible. 
Uh, and uh, they had visions of a huge hotel. They built three small hotels, but nothing big like this one. But what happened in the end, in 1952, the last house fell down and fell into the ocean and they closed it up. So what happened with the history of Bay Ocean? So 1906, Thomas Potter bought those 600 acres. $20,000 is what he paid. They had 4,000 lots of which he had sold 1,600. He wanted to have the Olympic City or Atlantic City of the West. And in the Rose Festival 1907, he had a float. Everybody kept on saying, Bay Ocean, where's that? Said, buy a lot. Uh, and then uh, from 1912, when the official opening occurred, all the way up to 1917, they started building. They built, oh, hundreds of houses down there. Three hotels, a school, a store, a bakery, a post office, businesses, bowling alley, and a Texaco gas station. But in 1914 and 1917, Army Corps of Engineers built the North, Jet North Jetty. Why didn't they build two of them? Because it cost $800,000, they ran out of money. And they didn't build the other one for many, many years. And what happened was it starved the sand coming into that area. Uh, and, and, and so as a result, the whole spit eroded away and Bay Ocean disappeared. All those houses and buildings fell into the ocean. Uh, and then in 1928, the whole thing went bankrupt. Uh, in 1932, the natatorium was de uh, determined to be unsafe. In 1936, the roof fell in. Major erosions continued in 1939, 42, 48, and in 52, the last one, it cut the spit off and it was, became an island. 1952, that's when the post office closed. They closed up shop and Bay Ocean was gone. And if you go to the coast, there are two signs on either side of the bay down there say Bay Ocean, the ocean, the city that fell into the, into the ocean. And that's the story because they did not understand, the Army Corps of Engineers did not understand that you have to understand the, the longshore drift and the movement of the sediment along the beach because they hadn't done that. Then finally they got enough wa uh, money to build the South Jetty, built it in 1969 and 1971. Uh, and what happened is it trapped the sand and the sand came back and now they have a big spit and it's all a nature preserve that is out there today. Uh, and so that is a story of Bay Ocean and the city that fell into the ocean. All right, now what I'd like to do is another one of the questions that we put in was about European beach grass and the four dunes. And so here is the beach, the active beach. We're on the Halo spit. These are some of my students from Portland State having lunch. And th that dune that is there is 50, 60 feet high. Most of the, the dunes along the Oregon coast never got more than five, 10 feet high uh, on, on the spits or even in back of all of the beaches that we have got down there. But then in the 1930s, the ODOT, Oregon Department of Transportation, brought in European beach grass from Northern Europe uh, because it, it, it stabilizes sand dunes and they wanted to stabilize the sand dunes. But what happens is uh, the sand comes in, hits the beach grass and it just continues to grow up and grow up. In fact, if you bury it, it, it it's like a fertilizer. And so what's happening along the coast, all of those dunes are growing and it's all because of the European beach grass, which is uh, uh, an introduced species. Now, I just want to get back to this whole idea of cells along the coast major headlands that you have got. Cape Falcon, which is here, which is Neakani Mountain, uh, right there. And then if you go right down here to Cape Mears, that is one cell. Uh, and there's another one from Cape Mears to Cape Lookout, another one from Cape Lookout down to Cape Kowanda, another one from Cape Kowanda down to uh, Cascade Head. And so what happens is all of the sand that you find in those cells comes out of the rivers and it goes back and forth and back and forth. Uh, depending upon winter and summer, remember, it goes in and out, in and out. Um, and, uh, and so uh, uh, so during those El Nino years, what happens is the, all of the erosion occurs at the southern end and, and then strips those beaches and the sand goes up to the northern end. Here's Neocani Mountain and then, then there is going to be uh, the, the city that is uh, Manzanita is going to be buried under all these sand dunes. Whereas Cape Mears down here or further on north, Neskowin, the southern end, you have the erosion. And so here is the cell. There's Neocani Mountain to the right-hand side. 
And here's Cape Falcon. And you can see that is one of these sails. And the, the sand just keeps going back and forth and back and forth. Kurt, Kurt Peterson, a famous geology professor in our department, has studied that. And he said, rarely does the sand go out around the headlands, generally stays within that sail that you have got. But during El Nino years in Oregon, we call it El Nino because not only do we get an awful lot of rainfall, we also get erosion of the beaches at the southern end. And this is just north of Newport, which is at the southern end of that cell. And uh, it nests the wind the same way. And it uncovers a lot of trees that were here. That was the forest. The old beach was way out uh, to the west of there. And then it has... Uh, what has happened is the the beach has eroded back into those, and the, some of these beach, these old forests are two to four thousand years old. So that is a type of ghost forest that we have got along there, which is buried in a normal year. You don't see that normally. Uh, back in 1982, when we had the the first uh, named um, El Nino year, we had huge movement of sand in these cells and erosion at the southern end. Cove Beach, which is south of, uh, of um, Cannon Beach, had eight houses that were undercut. Here's one of them and they had to be torn down. Here's another one, that, uh, incredible erosion that occurred during that 1982. And then also another one, as you can see here, uh, and another one here. Uh, and, and so El Nino years, a lot of erosion at the southern end that you have got. Another El Nino was 1997, uh, and this was a famous uh, uh, housing development, or actually condo development, called the Capes, which is very close to Oceanside, very close to Tillamook, uh, and, and all of these condos were at the, the very edge of the cliff. Well, what happened was there was a big sand, sand dune at the bottom of the, of the cliff and that was buttressing the landslide. The El Nino came in, huge erosion, removed the sand dune, and there was nothing buttressing, and the whole landslide took off and reactivated, and all these houses said, what do we do? And so they sold um, uh, to a company, a moving company, that would uh, pay a dollar a piece for each one of those, and he said that he would move them away. Eventually, what happened is the next couple of years, the sand came back in, restabilized the landslide, and now he has all of these houses and rents them out. So along our coast, we always will generally have a cliff that is in back of the beach. That's showing us that the whole coast is uplifting uh, and the whole coast is uplifting that we have got. Uh, and sometimes what happens when you, uh, you have erosion in that cliff, some of the bedrock of the cliff gets cut off from the cliff and creates what we call a stack. So any stack that we see was generally associated with the coast uh, and then it ha has grown. And then you might have a cave developing in the cliff and then it may cut right through and that forms a sea arch. So along the coast we have sea caves, sea arches, and then uh, stacks. And so Oregon is very noted for all of its sea stacks. The most famous sea stack, the one on the right hand, Scotland, I'm sorry I threw that in. The one is Cannon Beach and then Haystack Rock. There it is, one of the uh, five most photographed places in the state of Oregon is Haystack Rock along the coast. And the other Haystack Rock is Cape Kiwanda down in Pacific City. It too is a basalt, uh, it's off the coast, big sand dunes in here. I'm gonna come back to that in just a few minutes. A big story that is there everywhere we go on the coast, there is a story. Just trying to show you a few of them as you go. As you go down down, uh, down south into the Klamath, you have huge stacks that are there. Some of them are erosions of old landslides into the ocean. Some of them are actual uh, disconnection and erosion and formation of the stacks we talked about. Here is a sea arch. Sorry, I threw this in. This is from California. Uh, but here is in Oregon. This is Arch Rock. You can see right out there uh, that you have got uh, uh, up and down the coast. Now, Oregon has an interesting thing. We have huge numbers of sand dunes up and down the Oregon's coast. And when you think of sand, what do you think? Desert. Well, this is, we do not have a desert along the Oregon coast. Where did all of this sand come from? Well, uh, 25,000 uh, years ago, 25,000 to about 12,000 years ago was the last major glacial period. North America was covered with a lot of continental glaciers all over Canada and Alaska, coming down into the northern part of the United States. And what happened is, and, and same thing in Europe and Asia, 
um, you had these huge continental glaciers, where'd all that water come from? Out of the oceans. And the ocean level dropped 300 feet during that period of time. And so uh, where was the uh, ocean off of the Oregon coast? It was some cases five, six miles off of the coast. Uh, and so you had beaches that were formed out there. And then 5,000 years ago, sea level got back to where it is today. And, and it's between the 12,000 years ago, the end of the, the last glacial period, uh, and 5,000 years ago, all of that sand that was uh, from those offshore beaches was brought back in and, uh, and it caused, it had no place to go and it formed huge sand deposits. Class of Plains, uh, just south of Astoria, uh, then you have got Florence, which is down south, and then Bandon Dunes down uh, in Cape Blanco right there, uh, uh, shown further down south. So you have huge amounts of sands along the coast. All of that has blown in off of the oceans uh, in the past. Uh, and, uh, and, and so maybe some of you have gone dune buggy riding um, down, down in Florence or down in the abandoned dunes area. Uh, and so here is um, uh, Pacific City, famous forest dunes. These are what we call parabolic dunes in here. They're partially vegetated, big dune complex down here. Uh, and uh, this is one of the few beaches that, that you could actually drive vehicles down onto the, uh, the beach and then put your uh, boat into the, the water down here. But I'm gonna show you a big study that we did up here, left-hand side of these dunes. Because when you look at them, there are all these big black lines going across each one of those. Those are paleosols. Those are old soils. That's the old land surface that you see there. Uh, and you probably had trees on them in the past. And those showed periods of stability. And so here's one here. And we had five or we had nine different ones all the way. For, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one. And there were some further below. Uh, here's a picture of one that we looked at. There's a beautiful A horizon, a BW horizon, and a C horizon that is there. Uh, and, and so we, and we found charcoal in all of them. Uh, and as a result, we could date them. And the lowest one that was found down there was 5,000 years old. Uh, and then as you went up, the next one was 4,000, then 3,000, then 2,500, 18, blah, blah, blah. And it shows us uh, that the sea level is rising up, uh, it had reached there. And then you have stability, periods of stability and instability. All of them with the A horizons had a lot of charcoal in them, probably major forest fires along the coast, uh, create, burning the trees that were there. And, and then you would have a period of instability afterwards. Interesting story. Next time you're down there sipping a beer at the brew pub, uh, right at the base of uh, Cape Kwanda, Great beer down there. Uh, think about those buried soils and 5,000 years of history that are there. Another thing I wanted to mention is safety along the coast. And that is we have a lot of rip currents on the Oregon coast. When you go to the beach, here you are up on the beach here, and you look out and you'll see surf. What you want to see is surf going across everywhere. That tells you that it's an offshore sand dune or sand bar that is out there and it's very very shallow as the waves come in they go over it and then they will break and then they will uh, it will get into deeper water that you get inside but what happens is if you don't if you have a lot of surf zone and nothing in between it's telling you deep water and what happens is the water gets trapped on the other side of the the um, uh, sandbars here and then comes back out and it goes back out every time the, the wave comes in that is what we call a rip current in the old days we call them rip tides but it has nothing to do with tides and so if you have kids and you're going to the beach don't let them swim here you don't swim here because you can get out there and all of a sudden you be ripped off your standing there and just taken right out in a very very short period of time uh, and you uh, you might drown uh, if you ever get caught in one, what do you do? You just uh, swim to the right or to the left. That's what you do. So at, when you're at the beach next time, be sure to look for the area of no surf because it's deep water. To end with, what I wanted to do was talk a little bit about earthquakes. Uh, and very, very important uh, that we have here in North America. And remember, we have three different types. We have ones that occur in the North American crust where we live right here in the Portland, Vancouver area. And the longer the fault that we have there, uh, the bigger the potential is. And we were now up to about 7.2 earthquake magnitude that we can get 
uh, here in the North American crust. Off of the coast, out in the Juan de Fuca plate, especially that fault that is found between the Juan de Fuca plate and the Gorda plate, uh, you can get up to 7.3 earthquakes out there. Uh, and uh, most of the time in the news, they will say, oh, there was a uh, 4.2, 4.1 off of the coast of uh, Coos Bay or Bandon. That is uh, that fault that is between the Gorda and the Juan de Fuca plate. And, but then the big ones uh, that we are really concerned about here is the subduction zone earthquake where the plates are, are, are passing by one another and they are not slipping. They are building up, building up, then breaking. Uh, that is a 9.0. Uh, earthquake hazards that we worry about, uh, shaking. Uh, I mean, if you are in a building, the bigger the magnitude, the bigger the amount of shaking that you have got. In the Portland area, we worry about amplification. The thicker the sediments underneath your house, the, what happens is the waves come in, they will get bigger and bigger. Uh, liquefaction, this is where uh, you have sandy parent material with high groundwater table. Where do we find that? primarily along rivers, along where the airport is, and North Portland is one example of that, uh, the, uh, the Willamette River, etc. cetera. Uh, what will happen is that solid ground will turn to liquid, the buildings will tip over uh, and, um, and, and fall down. Landslides, uh, it will reactivate a landslide. Uh, and, and in fact, we, uh, we map landslides in Oregon because if it's moved once, it has a high potential for moving again. We don't want people building on old landslides because if we have a big earthquake it may start moving and why are we concerned because landslides are not covered by homeowners insurance and we want to save people money and save lives if we have a subduction zone earthquake along the oregon coast all of the major highways between the willamette valley and the coast will be shut down by landslides that are coming down and so we are in the coastal communities are going to have to fend for themselves and so therefore, uh, they are preparing for that, which is very good. And then tsunamis, in the old days, we called them tidal waves. Now, there is a seismic sea wave, a good Japanese uh, name. And we'll talk about those. Those are big waves that are coming in uh, along the coast. We tell people along the Oregon coast, if you are knocked to the ground by an earthquake, it's that big and it continues on and on and on, seems forever, three, four minutes, uh, that is a subduction zone earthquake. Don't wait for the official people to say, that was the big one, because it was. You have 20 minutes to get to high ground, above 50 feet, to get away from the potential tsunami that is going to be coming in. Um, and so Cascadia, uh, here we will have earthquakes periodically about every 500 years uh, for the big ones, 9.0, and they will last three to four minutes. The coast will drop six, five to six feet. And then it will shoot off towards Japan anywhere from 30 to 100 feet in a westerly direction. As the land goes out, what does it do? It creates a big wave that comes back. That's your tsunami. We'll displace that water. Uh, and then that tsunami will be anywhere from 15 to 50 feet high. How do we know that? Well, we look for the deposits. Again, Kurt Peterson, our famous geologist in our department, and students from Portland State looking up and down the coast have found deposits. We used to think up to 20, 25 feet, and then in back of Seaside, he found deposits up to 45 feet. And so that's why we put that marker 50 feet. So as Cascadia will cause landslides, liquefaction along the coast, a, lo a lot of shaking, a lot of aftershocks, and then the tsunami. So how do we put this together, this story together about the earthquakes? Well, a guy named Brian Atwater, uh, a, a geologist with the U.S. Geological Survey out of Seattle, was traveling up and down the Oregon and Washington coast, and he find these ghost forests. And he said, whoa, what killed these? Well, if you want to find out what killed a tree, what you do is you find wood just underneath the bark. Uh, and, and then you date it using radiocarbon, and all of these trees came out with dates about 300 years old. Or you go out into the estuary, like you, I'm showing you right here. You dig a soil pit. Here's Brian on the left-hand side. And you see a buried A horizon. That used to be at the top. But remember, after everything sinks, after the last earthquake that you have got, uh, then uh, uh, 
that whole area is going to be on the bottom of the bay and then bay muds from floods for the next uh, two or three hundred years are going to build up on top of it then it's going to uplift it's called we, we call co-seismic uplift and then co-seismic subsidence when it occurs those uh, uh, a horizons also came out about 500 years again ago and then what he did is other people kurt peterson gary um uh, what's his name down in Northern California were drilling down and they would find other buried soils down there put together a sequence 300 years ago 800 years ago 1100 years ago so about every hundred years uh, ago uh, here is down in um, uh, Neat Tarts Bay at low tide uh, and here is the buried soil here from the last uh, last uh, uh, earthquake and then you can see an indentation of sand that was the tsunami that went over the sand spit and deposited the sand all over the bay and then this is all the bay muds you can see from here on up that were deposited since that last uh, one. Uh, and then, so uh, Brian Atwater said, you know, if we had an earthquake about 500 years ago, uh, um, uh, sorry, 300 years ago, um, we should have probably produced a, a tsunami that maybe went all the way to Japan. And the Japanese are incredible record keepers. And let's go over there. So he teamed up with Kenji Sataki there, who looked at the tsunami records, and they uh, uh, and they found a uh, uh, tsunami uh, that had occurred in the year 1700, uh, and it was occurred from one end of the country to the other. It was a meter, a couple meters high, uh, and uh, but they called it the orphan tsunami because there was no uh, earthquake in Japan and no volcanic eruption at that time. So it must have come from a long distance away. They didn't have the foggiest idea. And so Brian Atwater wrote a book called The Orphan Tsunami uh, using that name. Uh, and then, so the date was January 27th, the year 1700. Remember it's on the other side of the date line, so you turn it to the 26th. And then at 600 miles an hour as you move across, you come back and it is about nine o'clock at night on uh, January 26th, the year 1700 was the date of the last um, uh, subduction zone earthquake. Another phenomenal geologist, um, uh, uh, Chris, uh, Chris Goldfinger down at Oregon State University started looking off of the coast. And so here you can see there is Oregon, there is Washington, here is Cascadia, here's the edge of the Cascadia subduction zone. Uh, the rupture zone that is out here, and he looked at some of the major uh, stream or uh, uh, valleys coming off of the Columbia River, for instance, and off of the other ones. And then what he did is he looked at the deposits at the bottom. Every time that uh, there is a large earthquake, you'll get landslides on the on the sides of those valleys, and the landslides will come down and then rest at the bottom. That's called a turbidite, and they're going to have shells in it, and shells are made out of calcium carbonate. Uh, and therefore, you can date them using radiocarbon dating. And so he took all of these layers, all these sequences of turbidites, all the way up and down the coast, all the way up to Vancouver Island, and he put together um, and then dated them. And he found 41 different turbidite events in the last 10,000 years. 19 of them were in each one of those sequences that he had. So he said, those are full margin ones where the earthquake broke from the southern end to the northern end. And then he had 22 more additional ones in the southern part. Uh, and then so he put this together uh, and um, in these recurrence intervals. And the whole margin ones, he basically said every 500 years, there is an 8.7 to 9.2. Um, um, and, and, and so an article that was written five years ago in a uh, uh, famous magazine out of the East, um, um, uh, Catherine Schultz wrote this, New Yorker. She called it the really big one. The rest of us call it just the big one. And that means the whole margin uh, uh, earthquake is going to be, uh, the chances of that happening, 15% in the next 50 years. But the Southern Oregon margin, which Chris Goldfinger found, the average reoccurrence interval is 243 years. But it's going to be a smaller one, like an 8.0 earthquake. Uh, Catherine Schultz called it the big one. I call it the mini big one. Doesn't matter. Um, but it's it's more active that you've got here. If you have an early warning system, which I'm going to talk about, which was mentioned earlier in a second, you're going to have time to get out of a building. And the chances of that is 37% in the next 50 years. Uh, and so uh, here is the last uh, 8,000 years. The big lines are the subduction zone earthquakes, the full margin ones. And the ones in between are the mini big ones, the ones on the southern one, the Gorda Plate that is down south. And, and so 
Um, we at the beginning tonight that we talked about the new device that is going to be out. And uh, if we have an earthquake of a whole margin going from here all the way up to here, we're going to have maybe four or five seconds on our device to duck cover and hold. But if it's down here, southern margin, we are going to have three to five minutes by the time the S wave, because when an earthquake occurs, there's a P wave, then an S wave, and an L wave. All start at the same time. P wave is the fastest one, but there's no energy to it. S wave is much slower, but it's lots of energy. And then the long waves are the last ones. Those are the slowest ones. Uh, and, those, and so here in Portland, and even more so up in Seattle, they're going to have five minutes. Uh, we're going to have time to get out. That is very, very important for that, uh, th that we have that. And people ask, you know, what is the Oregon coast going to look like? Well, Tohoku in Japan in 2010, when it occurred, this is what it looked like after the tsunami came into the air. The Oregon coast is going to look kind of like this up to about 50 feet. And so we need to get people out of their houses and uh, to higher ground. Here's Kurt Peterson, a guy I bragged about here. We're looking at some buried soils along the Oregon coast on a Friends of the Pleistocene trip uh, down there. And then you can see some of the ancient ones going back maybe 10,000 years. This is just below E. coli State Park. So this has been going on for a long time. And so you get an earthquake, you get, ver you get displacement of the sea, and then you get tsunamis. And so in the old days, we, this is what we thought tsunamis looked like. You look out in the ocean and waves would kind of just rise up and get bigger and bigger and bigger and then fall over. But now that we have camcorders, in, in the 2004 Sumatra earthquake, and this is a picture taken actually in Thailand, you can just look out flat ocean here and then all of a sudden look at a 20 foot wave coming in and it's continuous after that. That's what a tsunami looks like uh, as it is coming in. Areas like seaside along the Oregon coast really have to be quite concerned about it because the people who live down here need to get across a couple, get to higher ground. Big problem that they have. They're actually thinking about building very, very high structures along the coast. People go to that and then the water goes down underneath them. Uh, and then just south of here, uh, you have got Cannon Beach. And Cannon Beach, uh, they are one of the first uh, uh, communities along the coast to embrace the whole tsunami thing. And so if you are there on no at noon on Saturday, all of a sudden, all the loudspeakers in town will go, moo, moo, moo. This is the tsunami warning system of Cannon Beach. And in case of an emergency, you would be, uh, be told to get the higher ground. Uh, and, and so you have to worry about that. Now, along the Oregon coast, we also have to be worried about distant tsunamis. That is an earthquake up in Alaska or in Japan. Uh, and in 1964, the Good Friday earthquake caused a, ma a mini tsunami come down, caused a lot of damage right here in Seaside uh, and also a little bit down in Cannon Beach. And so we need to worry about those. So along the Oregon coast, we've got these signs, tsunami hazard zone. Every time you dip below 50 feet, there's a sign there. And then when you're in that zone, there'll be other signs that say tsunami evacuation route. And so if you are staying in a campground or a house in the tsunami hazard zone, what you need to do is know where the fastest direction to get to 50 feet elevation uh, in case of a, a large earthquake. And we thank Dogami, our state geological survey, for putting all this together. And so at the beginning, they talked about this new shake alert that becomes active on March 11th. So anybody who has a cell phone, uh, we will all automatically get it because all of us have the wireless emergency network, the WEA. And maybe some of you would remember getting Amber Alert. It's been a long time since I've gotten an Amber Alert. Uh, somebody is kidnapped and they're traveling up and down I-5 in a Rambler um, limousine or something like that. And then it, helping people find people. But this one, it will tell you. Uh, and this was developed by the U.S. Geological Survey at University of Oregon, University of Washington. Those are the major uh, people that worked on all of this. It will tell you that a large earthquake has occurred. It has just occurred, and it will tell you how long until the S wave comes. So you look down on your device, uh, your device and it will say um, you have three minutes and 22 seconds. That means it was the southern margin, and you can get out of the building, you can get uh, out of the elevator, you can get off of a bridge, uh, and get to some place closer. But it may just say, you have two seconds until you this hits and therefore duck cover and hold. And that's what we tell everybody to do because 
the majority of uh, deaths and, and injuries are from things falling on people. So get under something if you can. But it's a very exciting thing. You're going to hear a lot of that coming up uh, this week and uh, very exciting. So to end with, I just love the beach. In fact, I put this thing together at the beach uh, this last week. Uh, I love going down to Cannon Beach to the Sandcastle contest that they have down there. Uh, and you always have to have a picture from the beach. It's not mine. It's a professional one from Jones Photography. I mean, that's the Oregon coast. Look at that beautiful one. But I do have one that I took. That's with my family up at Crater Lake as it was uh, setting the sun was setting and i encourage you all to get up and get down to the oregon coast go up and down the coast northern california up into washington uh, and see some of the things that i've been talking about because wherever you go mother nature is shouting out and you need to get in tune with her and learn that story that she's telling you thanks a lot for the chance to come and talk to you tonight wow <laughs> that was a great lecture on geology of oregon coast thank you so much i you know, I, I live here, I know all these things, and every time I hear a presentation like yours, I, I'm always learning something more. It's, it's just fabulous. Um, as, as we get a couple of more questions coming in, I just want to um, just share that uh, I'm doing some virtual programming right now. And again, geology is a thing that we talk about. And one of the things that we have said is that geology just invites storytelling because you look around and you see all these places that just have stories to be told. And I I wrote that quote down when you when you said it, how everywhere on the coast there is a story. And so I just really wanted to um, reflect that and, and appreciate your comment there. So um, a couple of the questions that we have coming in are just um, some, going back to some of those questions about uh, sand and, and how it's moving along the coast. And could you just kind of, um, there was a question just saying like the, the term sand cell uh, you used a couple of times. Can you kind of re rephrase what a sand cell is so we know, yeah, so, remember that term? So this whole concept was put together by a famous oceanographer at Oregon State University, Paul Komar. And, and, and so all of these headlands that are found up and down the Oregon coast, they define a cell. And the, the sand will move in between those headlands, north and south. In the wintertime, with all of the waves coming primarily from the northwest, the sand will move down to the south. But then if we have an El Nino year, it'll move back up uh, mm -hmm. to the north. So it moves back and forth. Uh, and uh, it's a concept. Now, you go down to California where you don't have a lot of these headlands. The sand is moving in a dominant direction because the longshore drift is primarily, I think, uh, from the south to the north down here. But here it's localized and it goes back and forth. And, and so that's what is happening with the sand in, in the cell. That's why the southern end of the cell, you get the erosion of a lot of the sand and these old forests coming through. Mm -hmm. Cool. And there, there's another question about, you, you talked about jetties, you talked about groins, and there's another um, phrase out there of a breakwater. How does that, how's a breakwater kind of fit? Is that the oh, same thing? It. So a breakwater is off of the coast. It is a whole bunch of very, very large boulders uh, forming a ridge that is going to be parallel to the beach. And, mm -hmm. and so if you have shallow ocean, then you can put the in. It's very expensive uh, to build it. And you need to have big boulders, which is also very expensive. California uses this to create a bay uh, for ships and boats, not ships, but boats. Uh, and, and so you put a breakwater out down there. Now, what happens is it stops the longshore drift. Uh, and so it stops the waves. And so the sand that comes in, so let's say the, the sand is moving in this direction. You build a breakwater here. Uh, it will have the beach will grade here. And then the, the other side of the breakwater, it'll erode away. And you can, right. you can uh, you know, uh, predict ahead of time erosion and deposition in those different areas. So speaking of that prediction of erosion and deposition, you, you had a timeline of the story of Bay City um, and, and you clearly laid out like all of us knowing now that the creation of that jetty affected the longshore current and the and erosion. But where in the history of our understanding of jetties and movement did we um, kind of come to that conclusion? You know, where in that timeline did that become the accepted answer of what actually happened? Um, actually, you know, the Army Corps of Engineers came back in afterwards and, uh, and, and started studying this. Uh, and then the and then when they built the other jetty, they finally got enough money in 1969 to do that. 
all of a sudden the sand started coming back and then he started asking the question looks like the sediment is moving up and down the coast now the army corps of engineers has a um a, a, a research area at vicksburg mississippi i used to take my students there when i taught at louisiana tech university and they would make scale models of every bay of every beach system and stuff like that before they built a structure they would look at the movement of the sand in those particular cases because they didn't want to have what happened at Bay Ocean occur again and again. Yeah. Uh, and so the their understanding, not only of the Army Corps of Engineers, but of geologists and sedimentologists uh, and oceanographers worldwide uh, in the last uh, 50 to 100 years has built up as we've had a lot of similar cases like this occurring uh, and, um, and saying, oh, the sand is moving. So now it's in all the textbooks. We shouldn't have those problems anymore. <laughs> Say so shouldn't, but I'm sure that there are stories out there. Um, how does the Columbia River contribute to sand on the Oregon coast? Huge amounts of sand coming out of the Columbia River. But a lot of it shoots right out onto the fan uh, and, and, and doesn't make it up and down the coast. But right there, the Clatsop Plains, huge area, all the way down to Seaside. And then north, all the way up to the Long Beach Peninsula. There's another spit just on the Washington side up there. And so that sand moves into those particular uh, areas. And so that cell on the Oregon, Washington coast has huge amounts of sand. And it was amazing. After Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980, uh, I, the beach at, uh, at Gearhart and at Seaside just grew as the whole class of plains just went gigantic because of all of that uh, uh, introduction of all that sand from uh, the eruption of Mount St. Helens. Well, oh. hmm. So switching gears a little bit here, um, you know, there's, there's new technologies. Um, I think LIDAR is, is what a lot of geologists are using, kind of penetrate and see through the surface vegetation to to you know, reveal a lot of these things. Can you um, can you give a better explanation of what of what lidar is for our audience, real quick? So uh, lidar is the godsend for geologists like me. I study landslides, and we have trees all over the the western part of of Oregon and Washington, Northern California, and we can't see them uh, even if we're down on the ground. But uh, it's a, la a a plane flying over using la uh, 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 lasers, and it shoots beams down. It, thousands and thousands per minute. Uh, and then it's recorded when it comes back up and the, it takes the longest distance and the shortest distance. Shortest distance is bouncing off the top of the tree and the longest distance is the actual ground where it is, the light, uh, laser beam has gone in between trees. Uh, and so you've got two maps that you've got. The foresters uh, take the, high, the, the, the first return and they get an idea of the age stand of the forest that you've got. Geologists and geographers, we get the, the land that we have got down there and we look for scenes of faults. We look for um, things moving like this. We look for scarps where landslides have broken away. Below a scarp, you will have hummocky, bumpy topography where the landslide has come back down. And so what we are doing is remapping the whole western part of Oregon and Washington to see the uh, uh, all of the landslides that we have had. Uh, and it's amazing to us what we are seeing. And then we're looking for the big landslides because the big landslides we think are subduction zone earthquakes. And we'd love to find buried soils in those. So mm -hmm. LIDAR... It, it, is not only helping us learn about hazards in the in the past and get, getting a lot more accurate about it, but it also is giving us a base map that we can have for building things. And it's a plus or minus just a foot uh, in most places. Uh, and, and so it gives you a good base map to use better than the U.S. Geological Survey, which is plus or minus, you know, five feet or something like that. So Thank with these tools like with like LIDAR and satellite imagery, like how does local sampling come into, uh, into use uh, for okay. you know, the Wait, modern geologist? So, you, so what you do is you do the LIDAR of the, the big picture for the particular area that you have got. Uh, and then you go out and you study the individual landslide or the fault. Oh, and then you trench the faults. And it, in fact, uh, uh, at Portland State, we have an unbelievably great um, uh, Professor Ashley Strig who is into trenching the faults. And they trench uh, with Scott Bennett uh, and Ian Maiden of, the, of our State Geological Survey up on Mount Hood. Uh, 
And here's a fault that goes from Mount Hood all the way down to the Columbia Gorge. And that's why it, it's so long that it could produce a 7.2 earthquake. Mm -hmm. uh, and they go out and, and trench those. So you go out and trench it. For the landslides, what we do is we go out and we look for wood to uh, to actually date the landslide. We look for buried soils and things like that because we want, and then we ask the question, what's the geology, what's the slope angle and things like that. Because what we do is we can map where the old landslides were. That's what we call an inventory map. Then what we do is we uh, produce a susceptibility map. What are the characteristics of those landslides that you've got? And then you put it into GIS and you can say, oh, here's an area that hasn't failed, but it could in the future. That's still a high uh, potential area or a low potential area. And then we take with GIS all of the roads, the houses, the bridges, the dams on top of it, and you can make risk maps. So we can make all three of those. And for planners, it is so helpful to have accurate ones. And geologists, uh, that's what our state geological survey does. Washington super geological surveys for both of our states. Oh, there's <laughs> so much in there. And, you know, and part of, again, part of my role as an educator is like there's so much opportunity for people to do geology and have it apply to everyday life for everybody. So, um, you know, go be a geologist is, is what I'm saying. Um, what, let's see, we'll transition here into some earthquake questions. Um, somebody said that there's some, um, some work on some tears within the Juan de Fuca plate. Do we know if the plate breaking up in areas will make a large Cascadia earthquake more or less likely? Yes, and so this is, this is a fairly new idea of the, the Juan de Fuca plate splitting as it goes down. Uh, and then also the Farallon plate, uh, which was that big plate that was, was going underneath North America. In fact, I read, a, I read the title of an article on that just today. I didn't read the article. I don't have the background to actually answer that question for either one. Uh, and, and so it's a fairly new idea. And so I'm going to have to say I'm going to have to pass on that one because I don't have the background. <laughs> Always an opportunity to learn more, right? Yep. Well, um, can you review some of the things about how a earthquake in the southern part of the plate would affect Portlanders? You know, I know there's a lot of like the 9.0 at the coast. What does that mean for folks in the valley or in Portland in terms of magnitude? So an 8.0 8 uh, on the southern margin. So that's really the Gorda plate that you've got down there, which Chris Goldfinger has shown is twice as active as the whole margin uh, breaking up. Um, it will knock us to the ground. An 8.0 is a huge earthquake. Uh, it will it'll cause damage uh, all the way to the Portland area, all the way up to Seattle. Uh, and and there most likely will be a tsunami, too, along the coast. Uh, so you'll have all of those. It's just the amount of shaking that a 9.0, which is the whole margin breaking in Portland, is going to be extremely uh, severe. Uh, Southern Oregon, it, it's going to, because the P wave is much faster than the S wave, we've got three plus minutes until it arrives. And so we can get out of buildings, we can get students out of schools. Uh, and now we're going to have, a, the teacher is going to look at his or her device and say, oh, it's duck cover and hold right now. Oh, no, we are going to get outside as fast as we can. I mean, it, and, and so um, we have those two big earthquakes. And for the southern margin one, it's going to save us. Yep. Uh, the the big one, we got to duck cover and hold just hold on for life. Um, and but it's going to cause damage uh, that we have got here, and uh, and so we need to be prepared for it. But we do, we want to save lives. Definitely. Um, so we switch subjects a little bit again, and kind of go to the idea of, of terrains and you know accretion onto the North American plate. Um, so there is just a bit of a question of like, you know, the North American plate, as I recall, was kind of basically the Oregon Idaho border. That's more or less where that kind of started. And so our entire state all the way from there has been, um, are these accreted ter um, terrains. And, and so do you see, um, you know, you were talking at the co you know, at our coast with the uplift, you kind of see the, the edge of the cliff and the erosion of the, of the ocean. Is that also seen and other places in Oregon, since that was those were parts where the ocean was meeting them. Is those? I don't know if I said that very clearly. <laughs> yeah. So what you're doing is you see a progression of the shoreline from eastern Oregon all the way to the coast. Right. What yeah. You, what you're asking is, 
And there aren't many places where we can see that because we've had so many volcanic eruptions in between that have buried any of those old mm -hmm. accreted terrains. And so the accreted terrains are underneath the Cascades. They are under, well, but in the uh, Klamath Mountains, that is all pure accreted terrain. There's no volcanic uh, material on top of it. Uh, but uh, the, you do uh, you do not see uh, old shorelines. We can't go up to uh, Pineville and say, "Can we see an old one?" Well, Pineville's got the super volcano and the caldera that is there, and, and okay. so it's uh, it, it's burying anything that you've got up there. But uh, but we do see the accretion terrains uh, uh, going all the way across the state, and then we have this new concept of Celestia. Uh, yeah. which is all of the basalts that are underneath the coast range that we've got here, which is a creative terrain, and it was most likely related to the Yellowstone hotspot that is now underneath Yellowstone. Yeah, I hadn't heard of that Celestia um, terrain before. That's that's pretty interesting. And and again, like how, you know, every every layer, there's so, there's a new story, you know, as you keep on going down. Um, and just a, a note to our audiences, like we still are taking questions, um, so go ahead and put those into the chat. So let's hear what else we got. Um, there's a question here about, uh, can you explain more about how stacks were created and eroded versus the rest of the basalt flow? Oh, so yes. Um, so for instance, um, if we go down to um, Haystack Rock in, in Cannon Beach, all right, if you stand in, uh, on the beach uh, with your back to Haystack Rock, look in, you'll notice that the, the, the beach goes like this and that there is a hill right there. That is the basalt flow uh, that comes off of uh, the major basalt flow, uh, which formed Tillamook Head. Uh, and, and, and so it has eroded between that hill and Haystack Rock. Why does that erosion occur? And it has to do with... Uh, the basalt, because as the basalt uh, uh, solidifies, what does it do? It shrinks, it cracks. And so the amount of cracks that you have got, the more cracks that you have got in the rock, uh, the faster the erosion that you can get in the, in the ocean. Uh, and so it's what we call differential erosion. More cracks mean faster erosion, less cracks, less erosion. Uh, and so that's why Haystack Rock had very, very few cracks in it. And so that's why it has lasted so long. Whereas um, the, the area in between had lots of cracks. And so generally that is what is causing differential erosion in those particular cases and, and stacks to form. Is, is there any guess to why that area had more cracks versus the part that's still with us? Like Remember the, 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 that those flows came down 15 to 18 million years ago. Yeah. And uh, nobody was around. And so um, it, it's hard. You know, we, geologists always look for that. Any clues. Wherever we are, we take notes. We take pictures. And, and sometimes later on, some brilliant young geologist will come by and say, oh, Burns, you missed that. And this is really what happened. So we, they haven't figured that one out yet. Yeah, but then we also have the ability to use geophysics to see what's down underneath. And I don't know if anybody recently has actually looked at uh, how thick the the beach is under between mm. Stack Rock and the land, and so we have all these tools at our disposal, which is makes it so much fun. You know, it, it's interesting, and, and you are asking absolutely great questions and translating from the. So I thank you for that. Uh, when I entered into geology back in the 1970s, uh, it was primarily a male uh, male dominated science. Mm -hmm. Very, very few females, and they were primarily uh, paleontologists, fossil people. Oh. Hmm. Now, in our programs at Portland State, we're running 65% female and 35% male. Uh, it is, uh, we have great students and lots of it, it, uh, females. Females uh, are welcome. It's lovely for me to see it open up. Uh, now what we need to do is also open up to students of color, uh, a little bit more than we have done in the past. And um, math has been a, a big problem in the past, but uh, hopefully it'll change. So it's from my standpoint, watching and seeing our profession change has been so exciting. Uh, and, and I love it. And so it's good. Sorry, I digressed. 
I, I, I no, those imagine. are those are, those are great things, you know. And again, you know, as one who does education and wants to um, encourage people to right. see opportunities for them wherever they go, hearing things like that from you know um, professors like yourself, and it's so and just, encouraging. One it's other so thing vital. along that line, in case anybody you've got some young people along here, geology is fun and interesting and exciting, and wherever you go in the world, there's a story, and it, it's great. Uh, and in Oregon, we have. Uh, uh, four universities who have ge geology programs. We have Oregon, Oregon State, Portland State, and Western Oregon. Uh, Western only just has a bachelor's degree. All the other three have bachelor's, master's, PhDs. But all of the community colleges, community colleges uh, uh, in the all over Oregon have got great geology instructors. And in Washington, Lane, uh, uh, um, across in Vancouver and all over Washington. Washington actually has more geology programs at the university level than Oregon does. And so uh, if you, there are lots of places to study geology. Uh, if you like the outdoors, I encourage people to do it. Well, you know, most of these questions I am asking are from the great crowd we have, but I do have one that I kind of, since we've opened it up, just ask a lot of people is, was there a, a moment you mentioned in the um, 1960s landslide in Eocola, was that, is there a moment of your childhood you're like, wow, geology is really cool. That was just like that hook that kind of brought you into the field? Well, the hook that brought me into the field was a young lady. I mean, my <laughs> first two degrees were in chemistry and biochemistry. And I, I studied uh, one year uh, summer overseas, and so I was ahead. I was at Stanford. And, uh, and so I was a senior and I just had to take physical chemistry fall, winter and spring and just fill in with other things. And this cute gal, I uh, saw her down at the post office before school started and this was before computers. And, and, she, and I said, what are you taking? And she said, I'm taking this, this, this and geology for a science elective. I said, funny thing, I'm in that class too. And we finished the conversation. I ran down, signed up. I said, I get to sit next to her in, in the, that geology class. And I was very excited, went to the first class. I had seven fraternity brothers surrounding her. I lost out on the girl, but I fell in love with geology and it's a love that, uh, um, that I have to this day. And so that is, but then I, my first teaching job, I taught in Switzerland from 70 to 75. In the middle of the Swiss Alps, I wake up in my chalet every morning and I had a 300 or 180 degree view of the mountains and I took my students 45 field trips a year hiking in the mountains how could you not want to be a geologist uh, yeah. and it was absolutely wonderful so living in the and I've lived in the mountains of Colorado and New Zealand and here and so um, geology is all around you and it just grows so I never taught chemistry after my second year in Switzerland um, <laughs> even though I got a couple degrees in it uh, and I became a geology PhD is in geology well, you know, one of the things that I like about geology, you know, in all science fields is there's a lot of interdisciplinary. And so there's a question here that's kind of asking about um, when working with 3D modeling, is, it, uh, is anybody working on uh, an animation of the formation of Oregon landforms over time to kind of tell this story visually and in, in, uh, in animation? Um, and and we, uh, we have incredible animation uh, uh, tools today. A new one just came out on the movement of the continents from the beginning of time and coming together and ramming in and, and dividing up. And so I talked to you about Pangea uh, mm -hmm. to, to today, and, and it's, it, it's, it goes all the way back to the beginning of the earth. So we have the abilities. We need a graduate student uh, to kind of take that on. Nobody has done it for Oregon. And, and we are slowly getting together the story and the study of that, uh, and, and eventually I think that it will happen. And it, it's amazing what we can do. Our teaching tools, I mean, when I started teaching, you had a chalk and maybe an overhead projector and slides. Uh, and now we have PowerPoints and we can do everything. And we, uh, it is amazing what, as an instructor uh, that what we have at our, our ability to use, to teach and do research and learn. So yeah. it's an exciting time. Very exciting. <laughs> well, add in a level of kind of imagination and, you know, um, can, you know, is anybody playing around with, you know, you have, we know what Pangea looks like, but if you fast forward the uh, same amount of time into our future, are those projections and animations out as well? Oh, yeah. And, 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 and in fact, in my lecture that I do on plate tectonics for my introductory class, I, what's, what's the world going to look like in 50 million years? So Australia is going to be ramming into uh, South America. The Atlantic is going to be much, much bigger. Um, and uh, and uh, Hawaii is going to be, uh, Hawaiian Islands is going to be going down in, in the subduction zone up in Alaska. 
uh, and, uh, and, and, and many, many different things are going to be happening, and it's kind of fun. Uh, <laughs> you know, so we can predict that based on where, what direction all the plates are going. All right. Well, I think um, those are all the questions that we have coming in. Thanks to everybody who has submitted their questions. Thanks, um, Dr. Byrne, for answering all of those questions as well. So to everyone, I hope you've enjoyed tonight's event. And if you would like to watch the video again or share with your friends, check it out on the video uh, section of OMSI's Facebook page or our YouTube channel. And don't forget to follow us on YouTube. Uh, sorry, don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for updates on future events and inspiring content from OMSI. And I know I mentioned it at the beginning, but please consider supporting OMSI Science Pubs and making a donation via the Facebook donate button, or you can visit omsi.com/donate. Join us next week for lecture in. Uh, sorry, join us for our next lecture in two weeks on March sixteenth for a lecture on the evolution of the f of flavor with Rob Dunn, professor of applied ecology at North Carolina State University and the Center of Evolutionary Homogenetics, Homogenetics at the University of Copenhagen. Late night folks, I'm sorry. Please note, Rob lives in Copenhagen, so we are hosting this lecture at noon, 12 p.m. If you are unable to join us during the day, the recording will be available on both Facebook and YouTube, so you can watch it later. Once again, thanks to our partner at SailStream for helping tonight's event be possible and to Dr. Burns as well and to everyone. You can get more information on our website at omsi.edu. Thank you and have a great night. <laughs>